What are you boys doing here so far from home? You're Colt Maddox boys, ain't you? You boys ever been caught up in a booby trap? What's that? That's the sound I've been hearing for the last two nights. Sounds like it's coming out of the woods or the cornfield or something. Can you send that audio file to my phone? Sure. Hey, it's Richard. Seth McAllister wants to have a Skype call at 2 p.m. today. Give me a call when you get this. Listen, there is something fishy going on here. You best let it be. Do you think I don't know that everybody in this whole town sees me as a powdered keg just about ready to explode? <laughs> what could anybody do about it? What could you do about it? What if I was to explode right here, right now? <laughs> Who's there? Someone there? Well, why are you just standing? It's the same story we hear over and over again. Can you improve the turnaround time of our data and still maintain quality and flexibility? Oh, why, we should have just come to you in the first place. If I had sixpence for every time I heard some chap say that, I would be sipping a tall one on the shores of Tahiti right now. Well, good to hear from you, and glad to have you aboard. Oh, I say, oh, 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 you startled me. Come closer. Right. I take it you're here to tour the Xenometrics state-of-the-art facility. We like to do things a little more personal. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Professor Helix, spokesman and tour guide of Xenometrics at your service. I say, are you getting the rapid turnaround you expect? Are quality and flexibility lacking? Are you looking for experience that you can count on? A business partner that can give you what you want when you need it? We know firsthand how important, accurate, and quick data return is for scientists. Come closer. Let me show you how we accomplish precisely that at Xenometrics. Xenometrics is located within an established animal research facility that has been in operation since 1979. With over 60,000 square feet of dedicated vivarium and modern laboratory space, Xenometrics is well equipped to handle a variety of scientific needs. Our toxicology, pharmacokinetics and pharmacology groups are highly skilled with personnel who have an average of 15 years experience. Our veterinarians, micropathologists, and clinical pathologists average over 20 years of experience. Xenometrics uses the latest in scientific equipment and has the unique flexibility to test across multiple species. We pride ourselves on rapid turnaround, flexibility, and accurate results. Our data review process includes detailed quality control steps which ensure that your data is of the highest quality. We have dedicated quality assurance personnel who possess the knowledge and skill to guarantee compliance of worldwide regulations. To experience Xenometrics firsthand, we invite you as our guest to take a personal tour of our state-of-the-art facility and enjoy the finest in Kansas City barbecue. Now that you've seen what we are about, I guarantee you if you deposit your business card down in the little deposit box there, our CEO will personally contact you and start you on your way to accurately delivering what you need when you need it. Put Xenometrics many years of experience to work for you. As scientists ourselves, we understand your needs and how important rapid, flexible, and accurate turnaround is. Good talking to you. Uh, I must go.
from this field may come the cure for cancer. The NDDA may produce the cure for cancer. From this field may come the cure for diabetes. The NDDA may produce the cure for diabetes. From this field may come the cure for asthma. The NDDA may produce the cure for asthma. From this field may come the cure for heart disease. The National Drug Development Accelerator may produce a cure for heart disease. From this field comes collaboration. Universities working together. Scientists and research organizations working to bring new drugs to market. We all know that bringing a new drug to market costs up to a billion dollars. The process is arduous and can take years. The National Drug Development Accelerator will slash your time to market. Maximize your market exclusivity. And save your company millions of dollars. But more importantly, bringing new safer drugs to market faster will save or change the lives of millions of people worldwide. The National Drug Development Accelerator can make a difference. This is not our field of dreams. The National Drug Development Accelerator is available today. The NDDA represents one of the nation's greatest geographic concentrations of experienced pharmaceutical development, clinical research, and bioscience companies that span the entire drug development continuum from discovery through post-market. Right in the heart of the country. We have the human capital, bioscience companies, university researchers, and research organizations. Ready to fast track your discovery from the bench to the patient's bedside. The companies of the NDDA have already developed 50 of the world's top drugs. We stand ready to streamline your development and the approval process. The NDDA can change the lives of millions of children. The NDDA can change the lives of millions of seniors. The NDDA can change the lives of everyday people. If you are a drug company, scientist, a university, a biotech company, a hospital, or another party interested in being part of the NDDA. For learning more, please visit our website. The NDDA, saving millions of dollars for pharmaceutical companies like yours. The economic benefits to your company are significant and measurable. While the benefits to mankind go beyond measure. Join us. Join us. Join us. Join us. Join us. We'd love to have you join us. Join us. In making history. Light Environmental Incorporated specializes in the design, construction, and operation of various water and wastewater treatment systems. Each system is customized to the client's specific requirements and regulatory specifications with an emphasis on capital cost. Light Environmental provides state-of-the-art water slash wastewater treatment and design from the initial excavation and headworks through the affluent discharge. Depending on specific requirements, various treatment processes may include ultraviolet, UV, aerobic digesters, anaerobic digesters, covers, bar screens, lagoon equipment, aeration devices, and specific proprietary systems. Light Environmental specializes in assisting the client during the approval and permitting process with local, state, and federal regulatory agencies. Light Environmental Incorporated currently provides extended aeration plants, oxidation ditch systems, and conventional activated sludge treatment. Recently developed technologies controlled by or exclusively marketed by Light Environmental allow the rapid production of potable water from wastewater without reverse osmosis. Light Environmental Incorporated is focused on environmental concerns and utilizes the smallest physical plant footprint coupled with the most advanced and comprehensive technology in the marketplace today. There is no cost for a complete analysis of your water slash wastewater requirements. 
Light Environmental Incorporated is located at 27404 East Outer Belt Road, Greenwood, Missouri, 64034. Contact numbers are 816-537-9190. Fax 816-537-9113. Or visit us at our website. We would like to thank you for viewing a small part of Light Environmental's water and wastewater solutions. Please visit us at our website at www.kcwastewater.com or contact us again at 816-537-9190. Hello folks, Rebel here, the man with the most innovative, energy efficient, seamless siding on the market today. The only siding installed with screws. The only siding with an R value of over R9. The only polymer siding on the market anywhere. The response to our exclusive siding has been absolutely tremendous, but we still have a number of 40% discounts available for neighborhoods in central Iowa. You may never see discounts like this again. Call now. The uh, beginning of the day was uh, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, they got us up and we went to breakfast. And uh, after, immediately after breakfast, we went to uh, the briefing room. And uh, at that time is when we found out what our target for the day was. Ludwigshaven, there were groans all over the briefing room that day. Oh, oh, oh. Nobody was happy about going to Ludwig's Hall. In the briefing room is where the, the, the talk about target study and or talk about what, what to expect and uh, how many people are going to be in the formation, how many planes are going to be in the formation, and also what to expect flak-wise and possible fighter-wise. We all were a little shook up because they told us how many uh, 88s could bear on us and how many gun stations they had and and how many uh, aircraft were in the vicinity that could attack us and uh, we knew that it was going to be a long hard day. We could have anticipated some real nasty flak that day. Nobody was expecting too much from fighter fighter cover anymore because the the uh, the Luftwaffe fighters were were pretty well beaten out for a while. But but flak batteries were very strong and very powerful. Uh, our particular target was was uh, very well described and uh, and talked about at, at the briefing and uh, as uh, my navigator has stated before the we, we knew it was a very very difficult mission the 446 had been to Ludwigshaven many times before and after that one single day there's really nothing special about that one day that we went on because uh, the, the history shows that the, the 446 itself had bombed Ludwigshaven several times, and that would mean IG Farben, and uh, I'm sure many of the other groups went, went through IG Farben many times before and before and after. So there was a lot of bombing on Ludwigshaven. There was nothing special about our mission. Everything went smoothly. The weather just was beautiful, just beautiful. In fact, we had it was just a, a piece of cake going into the, into the target. We had no fighter interception. We didn't have any flak until after we dropped our bombs. But evidently, the, the flak gunners at Ludwigshaven knew our, knew our altitude, at least on that day, and they probably had enough practice shooting at some of the other flyers, the other flights that went over, so uh, uh, they had no trouble finding us that day. We started to see quite heavy blanks of flak and uh, smoke, puffing smoke in the air. And, and um, so, and uh, the problem, what we really saw was the fact that the flak was right at our level. And that's when I spotted this one burst that was out there quite, quite a distance, and the second burst was right in line with us, and then the third burst hit us under the wing. I could see bursts. I could see a lot of bursts before the flak hit us, right looking out the navigator's uh, bubble 
You could see them right below us and everything. I'd never seen flak that close to us before. And I'd been on 12 missions. That was my 12th. And I'd never seen flak that close to us before. That, and uh, it, hit, it hit close. And Immediately after we dropped the bomb, it seemed we were hit. Uh, we, we, we dropped immediately out of formation, just hit very badly. In fact, we lost the number one engine, was sheared right off the aircraft. We went into an immediate steep dive. I remember we had adjusted the throttles on the uh, operating engines to try to compensate for the thing, but she started getting away from us, and it started this, this, this spiral on down. From 23,000 feet, we, we went, we dropped 13,000 feet. Things began to get rough. We had to the fire, the engine, two engines were on fire, and so Lesko and Schaefer nosed the airplane down from 23,000 feet, and we pulled out, to the best of my recollection, around 12 to 13,000 feet. That 13,000 foot drop is an interesting experience to go through. You're pinned right up against the bulkhead. You can't, you can't move at all. And you just hang on to whatever, you, you don't hang on to anything. You're just pushed right up against the bulkhead. And um, everything else flies right up into place up against the bulkhead with you. We actually did not level out at 10,000, as I recall. We went down below that altitude. And when they pulled the airplane out and leveled it off, the flame, the fire went out. And uh, then Schaefer kept asking for a heading. He kept asking, they kept asking Phillips for a heading. We, we pulled out of the dive and turned west, or at least we were, we were heading west anyway, lucky enough that way, and continued on the westward course. And incidentally, the, um, the crew members threw everything out, ammunition, guns, everything, tried to lighten, lighten, lighten the airplane up. We kept getting lower and lower. We kept losing more altitude, and they were trying to get another engine started. And we had two engines going, and just as the second engine kicked over proper, the second flak came up at us from Saarbrook. And, and we were 3,000 feet, we were point-blank range. So there was no, no challenge to the gunners anymore. I kicked up some flak in the arm and under the lip here, and in the upper part of my arm. But I, I, as far as I know, I was the only one that was really hit with any flak. You were, you were frightened, I know that. I was scared. and. and uh, but uh, uh, as, I, as I said, we were so busy trying to keep this thing upright that uh, uh, just didn't get a chance to think of anything else but trying to fly it. Some of the flak started to burst near us, and uh, uh, Schaefer said, well, let's don't ride it in, let's bail out, and gave the orders to bail out, and everybody started to bail out. The order came to bail out, and that's what we did. We bailed out. The guys went out the back, and, and uh, somebody went out ahead of me in the front. And I think Maxwell went right down with the Phillips in the lower section of the airplane. How am I going to get out of this thing alive? That's all. And uh, I'm not even sure I was thinking of that. I'm just making sure that I, that I pulled my ripcord at the right time and, and, uh, and go from there. And I went out, and George was right behind me, and Schaefer, I guess, was right behind him. When they were told to bail out, there was pretty much they were on their own to get out. And uh, I know that when I when I started, I just looked back, and Schaefer was right on my tail to, to get out. And we had to go out through the bomb bays. It, it was really remarkable that we all got out, and, and everybody shoot open. When I bailed out, my ship, my my chute, uh, hook, hooked in the in the branches of it tree in this forest out here. We went through and looked at that forest. It's quite a thing. It looks pretty much the same as it did then. It, they're, they're, I think they, they call them beech trees. The trees are very exciting. They're just heavy branches up on the top and almost nothing along the length of the trunk. When I hit the air, uh, I tumbled quite dramatically and uh, tried to get into a seated position in order for my chute to open properly. And uh, when I did, it, it opened, and, and immediately I, it was a, a sudden stop-like type thing. I deferred my, my opening, uh, and, and uh, it seems to me I made one swing, and in the second swing I was in the trees. And, and uh, uh, 
I think I did that deliberately, but because there was some machine gun fire, I could hear some machine gun fire. Landed in a bit of leaves and banged my back a little bit, tore my fingers up. And otherwise, we come out of it okay. I fell into this area of wooded area, and I fell into the tree, and my chute collapsed, and I fell dead fall to the ground at that time and point. And that's when I broke my leg, and uh, I turned, uh, uh, I had evidently twisted because my foot was completely backwards, and my back felt like somebody had shoved a hot needle in it. And uh, so I laid there, I took my uh, chute, and uh, I, I heard these people coming, and I had taken my 45 out, and I took, had taken my medical case with the, which was an escape kit with money in it and I had morphine in it and I gave myself a shot of morphine in my right leg and uh, I thought, well, at this time and point they hadn't gotten to me but I dug the hole in the ground and put the 45 and the escape kit in the, in the ground and covered it very well. Uh, we, we got rid of our guns immediately, I, get, I got rid of mine. And if you were caught with a, with a thing that just, th th there was no doubt about it, you were executed. Having been the navigator, I, I at least knew that we were very close to French territory, but it, it wouldn't have made any difference from what I understand. It was fully occupied, and France or Germany, it would have mattered. We were, we were trapped in there. Uh, this crash, he lived the ginger because uh, he, he was about six years old when the ginger crashed on the land. And uh, he was amongst the kids who were running when the plane was crashing. They, after the crash, they played inside the plane. Hitler had issued an order to execute all evading airmen. And uh, Himmler really didn't fully comply with, with the order, but the order was to, 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 to execute all evading airmen. And, uh, and I thought that I could make a, a splint for my leg, and by about that time they came up on me and... We were picked up by the Luftwaffe. The, 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 the Luftwaffe evidently operated the flak batteries in this area, and they must have operated them around. So uh, I guess to some extent that was a very lucky break. And so they took my parachute. They told me, ah, for you the war is over. The Krieg is fertig. So they then prepared my chute with, with uh, some branches out of the tree and carried me down to the barracks. Well, I, I heard a lot of other confusion and that's when they found uh, Lesko and Phillips in the trees just beyond me. And, uh, they were to my left as I was laying on the ground. A member of the Luftwaffe and a, and a civilian that really captured me. And really, the fellow was only about 16 years old. Lang was very well, very, he was really in a bad, bad situation. He had his leg broken and, and uh, contrary to what they had said, I remember distinctly that we, Phillips and I, carried him out. But then they took us into town on the back of this truck and uh, I was on a stretcher, of course, on the bottom of the truck bed. And Lesko and Phillips were uh, braced on the side with the rack about three feet up. And as we drove through Sauerbrook, and the civilians were uh, throwing rocks and bricks and, and uh, all kind of making all kinds of uh, dramatically angry type noises uh, in their voice. And, well, we were taken to the civilian prison. I, 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 as I recall, we stayed there two or three days. And this is where I had the encounter with the German major that wouldn't give any medical help to, um, to uh, Al Lang. <clears throat> and I kept demanding that they should do something for him in accordance with the Geneva Convention. He spoke some broken English, but uh, he, he just, uh, he, he took his pistol and he just hit me across the, the mouth and, and um, kicked me a couple of times and uh, uh, just uh, made it known that he didn't want to hear from me anymore. Anyway, we got on the train at, uh, with our guards in, in Sauerbrücken and 
went from there to uh, Frankfurt uh, with about five uh, uh, train changes in the process. And then after uh, this two or three days or four days, I cannot remember exactly, we, we, we left and I, I actually got separated from, from the other two. And, uh, and I remember going through Frankfurt uh, on the way to the interrogation camp. And uh, I visualized, I saw uh, a, a, an American airman strung up in the, in the station at, in, in uh, Frankfurt. And uh, also saw uh, a German officer pull his Luger out and fire a round of ammunition into, into his body, or shot in that direction. So finally, we got into Frankfurt. It was dark, late at night, uh, or at least it was dark, and we, the bombing, there was a bombing raid about to go on. The sirens were going off and all. And they took us down into uh, the bombshell under the railroad station, and, uh, into a bomb shelter under the railroad station, and from there, uh, we were there, I don't know, four or five hours, uh, it was a long time. I had one German uh, soldier that was escorting me alone to the interrogation camp, and uh, uh, we actually got on the train, and I sat there amongst the German populace, and as far as I knew, they didn't even know I was American. The next morning, I went into the interrogation center, and uh, uh, a man came in, one German came in who could speak fairly good English, and he started asking me questions, and I told him my name, rank, and serial number, and uh, that went on for 30, 40 minutes, and, then uh, he said, okay, and uh, he sent another fellow in that uh, could speak perfect English, very good English, and, and he said that he knew who I was and where I was from. When they gave me the placard with my serial number on, and I have the picture of that, of course, and, and uh, they took that picture of me and then after that is when they set my leg and they didn't bother my back at that time but they set my leg in a traveling cast just below the knee and then I was sent to the hospital in Meiningen which was probably a five or six hour train ride. A couple of times on route to the prison camp we had air raids and uh, uh, we had to get off the train and, uh, I mean, they left us on the train while the Germans got off to take cover in the ditches nearby. But uh, uh, I, I, I do not know what happened uh, to, to Phillips and, and uh, Lang, because I never, never saw them after that. Once we had gotten to the interrogation center at Frankfurt, I no longer ever saw uh, George or uh, Phillips again, uh, and uh, uh, at that time and point is when we were totally separated. I ran into uh, Phillips and, uh, and Lockinger just prior to our being liberated. They were in the next compound in, 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 in Mooseburg to me, and uh, I was able to talk to them then. And uh, Lockinger at that time and point said that uh, he knew that some of the guys had been killed. And then there's a rumor that, um, that uh, somebody had seen Schaefer hit the ground and go into a, a barn or a shed, and that uh, a, a German followed him in there, and he had one arm and he had a hook on one of his arms, and that he executed him in, in, in the shed. They were, they were told to execute ex, uh, evading airmen, and that's probably what happened to the re re remainder of my crew. The hardest moment of the war, well, was, I guess, when I wound up 
being wounded and injured and <coughs> not being able to move <coughs> and not being able to be in contact with my wife and daughter.